old Bailey, this blueskin was led. He held up his hand, his indictment was read. Now rattled the chains near him, Jonathan Storm. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another exciting episode of The Mailbag here at Scoundrel's Alley. And uh, once again, at Stophole Abbey, in our secret location, can't tell anybody where that's at. Well, I know the first thing you're saying is, Eric, you're alone again. Where's everyone else? Well, that's my own fault. You see, the other night when I was being Christopher, we were all on the street together, and um, I was so engaged in bulking, the, um, entertaining the people around my table that I didn't hear the Bo Peep cry beef. And because of that, they all took off. I was stuck. I was left. Um, left me behind completely. Me. Left me. Just like I was nothing. No. I, I don't worry, don't worry. You see, the kind city fathers were, they understood my plight and they realized what had happened and they were so kind and they invited me to stay over for as long as I needed to. And um, they even gave me a fine place to stay, offered me three meals a day as well. And uh, they said I could stay here well, and, uh, well, answer some questions and get a chance to study the law and, and uh, lawlessness and pay my debt to society. I, I, I mean, um, Anything else that I needed to, to do uh, while I've got some time here. So I thought I'd go ahead and take this time to answer this, uh, the question that we had. Actually came in a few weeks ago. I'm just now getting around to it. Busy, busy, busy. Lots of things to do. But before I go any farther, don't forget, hit that like button, subscribe, and remember to share this with your friends. And if you don't share this with your friends, I'm going to go to your children and tell them what a wonderful time they could have with a liberal arts education. Stay in school, kids. <laughs> Look at what it did for me. Well, anyway, <clears throat> let's, let's just go ahead and, and get started. Um, Peter from Paul Paul, Pennsylvania writes, and that, all right, I made that up. Peter from Paul Paul, Pennsylvania doesn't exist. His name's Paul. Paul actually writes, I understand that the Canton crew would come and go from place to place. In a smaller town, would the regular residents realize that the crew was in the town to be put on guard, or would they just slide in unnoticed? Also, what was the local law enforcement? Constables, the sheriff, the watchman. With all the activity at the Old Bailey, for instance, with the transportation and executions, someone had to be apprehending these offenders for justice. Paul, that is a good question. I'm glad you brought it up. I'll be honest with you, uh, I've been working on this answer for a, a number of weeks now, and it wasn't until I get to this wonderful location and realized what a nice library they had full of books on the law and how to prepare yourself uh, for trial and um, how the best way to approach your sentencing. Uh, here, um, All sorts of good information on the law here, and I decided to take the time, go through their library, and find out some things. Unfortunately, when I put it down together, I found I've got enough for about 58 minutes of a lecture video. It's a bit long. So I'm going to give you a short overview, uh, just a few minutes. If there's anything in here that you guys have questions about, want me to delve into more deep detail, it's fascinating. There's a lot that can be done. But what I want to do today is I want to look over three things just very briefly to kind of answer Paul's questions. I'm going to divide these up into the three sections, where our laws came from and how we got to this place. Um, what are some of the law enforcement people that you would have seen in the 18th century and uh, what was going on in the colonies and what will what was happening in the colonies that will lead to kind of where we are today as far as as the street uh, street gangs were going on so having said that sit back uh, relax and uh, well let's get started for one thing we have to really establish the fact that our laws are English laws Basically, uh, we're English. I mean, yes, there's some French here, there's some Spanish, there's blah, 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 all this. But by and large, we're, we're coming under English law. The English law that we're using, uh, and we've been using it uh, since Alfred the Great in 871, put it together. He wrote a doom book. Uh, now, doom was the uh, an old Danish word for law or judgment. So it wasn't uh, doom, you're going to die. Uh, but it was a collection or a book or a codex of the laws that he was putting together for his time. Alfred the Great, I understand, was a very brilliant man. We, we, we tend not to think of these people as being as smarter than we are, but he actually was much smarter than I, anybody I know. Um, when he was putting together his doom book, uh, he gathered up some of the Saxon codexes that were going on, some of the Saxon laws. He taught himself Latin. He went and visited the Pope. He was widely traveled. And uh, he, he incorporated Mosaic law and 
uh, some of the works of the Acts of the Apostles, so both the Jewish law, uh, the Old Testament, and the Christian law, the New Testament. This is also where we get our idea of we were founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic. I know a lot of people say, oh, no, we don't want to do that. We're, we're not done. Guys, to be honest with you, uh, here at, at Scoundrels Alley, we are not trying to mold history into what we want it to. We are trying to throw out the molds, look at history itself, and see where she takes us. This book, this Doom book that Alfred came up with, a third of it, a third of it was directly straight out of the scriptures. Deuteronomy, um, Amos, uh, Leviticus, Acts of the Apostles, uh, James. So he did put this together, and he was looking at what was going to do. His entire introduction to his Doom book was a treatise on God and natural law. So... That's the where we are. So when we came to the Americas, it wasn't the Puritans who brought us what we, some people want to say, blah, 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 blah. No, uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic was the laws that we had. It was based upon these laws uh, from Scripture as well as what he was gathering up in, Saxon, in Saxony. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing about this was even though uh, Edmund, about 60, 70 years later, he's going to make some changes and then uh, Henry I will make uh, the major change. The big major change that Henry I is going to make around 1112 is up until then in both Edward and Alfred, their punishment was monetary. There was no criminal, uh, I'm, except for treason and, um, and violence against the crown, there was no physical punishment. Uh, they, it was monetary punishment. And they punished the people that you lived with, not just not the person who, who did the crime. Uh, Henry the first uh, in 1112 he's going to change that and turn it into not monetary crimes or not monetary punishment but to to establish a, a series of, of, of well execution um, stocks all of that stuff that that will figure so heavily later on now uh, the Assisi of arms was written in 1233. It's the major basis of all the laws that are going to take place in England and her colonies all the way up until, um, what did I, I think I've written down, 12, uh, no, I'm sorry, 1829. Uh, and that's when the Metropolitan Police Act will, will, will take effect. So we've got 800 years of basic law that was written over 1,000 years ago. So when we, when we think, oh, this is all modern, it's all new, no, actually, it's, it's very old and it hasn't changed much. Not a lot changes. There, there are things that do change in there, and again, if you're interested, I can, I can go into that in more detail. But again, it, it, it can get pretty deep. It's very interesting, uh, but I don't think that, uh, I don't really want to overstep what Paul's asking in his original questions. Um, <clears throat> very quickly, though, in the 15th century, or sometime around the 1500s, in the 16th century, uh, we start seeing something called Charlies. Charlies were private security, basically. There was no police department or anything like that. We have a sheriff, which I'll discuss in a, in a few minutes. He's the only one that's really a truly a professional policeman, as we would call them. Uh, and he's going to be established. Edmund will establish him. But the Charlies were the only thing else. Other than that, if, uh, if uh, we need a large group of, of mounted police for something, the sheriff uh, has the... Um, law on his side to to impress people into service and uh, make them become a posse. Uh, posse comitus is what it was called. <clears throat> um, sometime a little bit later in the 7th, the, the early, early, early 18th century, we see the Charlies being referred to by the French term police, P-O-L-E-S, police. Uh, and that's the first time we see the word police mentioned. Again, these are not professionals, these are private security. We don't have professional um, policemen as we as we think of, of today. Um, Henry Fielding will start the boast runners in the mid 18th century. Henry Fielding, some of you are familiar with him. He, he wrote Tom Jones. Uh, he will write that in the 18th century. Of course, prior to that, Mary of Queen of uh, William and Mary, she'll along with the Reformation of manners will start uh, the idea of a, a thief taker. I'm going to discuss those again in but a moment. And that's the way it's going to stay. Uh, again, we're not going to have a, plesh, a professional police force well into 1824 in England. Now, in America, we have it a little earlier. When we get to the colonies, we'll talk about that. But by and large, the laws were on the books, and the Crown enforced the laws only to the point where if you 
caught the person who did you wrong, took them to court, proved your case, then they would they would uh, punish them. Though a lot of times a lot of this was theft, and uh, quite frankly, as far as they were concerned, whatever was stolen from you, that's your problem. Uh, they'll punish the uh, the person, but to get your property back, that's your problem. Uh, hence, oh, that's where the thief takers will come in and play a big role in it. Um, other than that, the Crown was interested in insurrection, treason, uh, coining, and cattle rustling. Uh, cattle rustling, I don't know, whatever, but anyway. These were capital offenses as far as they were concerned, and the, ca and the Crown would take very dim view of that. The coinage, the problem with coinage is they estimate by 1698, 10% of all the coins in the English world were either counterfeit, were counterfeit, and the other 90% were shaved, or had, had been, uh, the, some of the base metal had been and ground off of them. So that, the Crown took that very seriously. What's going to happen with the Coinage Act of 7, 1698 too that will influence what's going on in law enforcement and criminality was they'll debase the value of the currency in, in Ireland, which causes, causes massive, massive, uh, well, poor people because all of a sudden your, your, your coin is, your money is worth nothing. So we see a tremendous amount of influence or, of, of people from Ireland then moving down into London as the poor um, because their currency has just been completely devalued. They have nothing then, so they're left nothing. And the Irish are going to play a big part into what's going on um, in the criminal world of England um, itself later on. So that kind of gives you an overview. I know it's, it's kind of a rough sketch overview, but again, there's so much more I could tell you. I don't want to, to overburden you uh, with things that you might not be in. Some of you are interested, some of you aren't. Let me know uh, in the comments or drop me a line at the end. Uh, we'll talk about that. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on to section two. As far as who's enforcing the laws. Now the laws, of course, like I said, um, most of this is monetary punishment. By now, of course, after Henry changes it, we have a tremendous amount of physical punishment going on. We've got the stocks, we've got uh, pummeling, uh, we've got the pillory, we've got we still have burning, uh, not as much. We don't have cutting anymore or the chopping of heads off. Thanks to Jack Kemp in 1657, he was really bad at chopping people's heads off, so they took that off the books. But the big thing was hanging. Uh, it became such such a problem though in one hand, because it, be, it was a circus-like atmosphere by now in the 18th century, it becomes a circus, so much that Henry Fielding, again, uh, he wrote Tom Jones, uh, he was the one that did the Bow Street Runners, uh, he wrote, many cartloads of our fellow creatures are once in six weeks carried to slaughter. So that becomes an issue because now there are so many people just being hung that the court system is getting overwhelmed and it's losing its effectiveness. These um, hanging days, and there were nine of them a year uh, that, that I can that I can figure out. Basically, there's about nine a year. For one thing, everybody in London was allowed to go to these if they wanted to, so they get a day off to go to these, and people take their whole families to go to these, and it become a big almost affair. Uh, we've got punch shows, we've got jongleurs, we've got street sellers, uh, we've got food sellers, all this stuff going on just to watch these people be hanged. Uh, horrible thing, but. Whatever. <clears throat> Again, if, if you're interested in that, let me know. Drop me a line in the uh, comments below, and uh, we'll do a, a session on on uh, punishment, which uh, Halloween's coming up. It might be a good time to do that. But the people that we're going to run into, the people that we're going to deal with, and, and what I'm looking at is I'm going to look at who was here in the 18th century. Now, some of these people have started much earlier, such as the sheriff. He'll start very, very early. And some of them are falling out of favor by the 18th century. A couple of them... Uh, will go into the 19th century and die out. But by and large, these are the people that you would have met. Uh, the first one I do want to talk about is, is the sheriff. Um, he's going to be established by Edmund as, as a reeve. He's called a reeve. Now, what the reeve did was he was in, he was the head, just like today, he was the head law enforcement of the shire, or what we would call a county. Now, the reeve, or he would become known as a shire reeve, as we get our term sheriff from, he had the, he enforced the laws to the point where he would apprehend criminals and take them to the magistrate. Now, the magistrate is who is appointed by the crown to pass judgment, to determine whether you're innocent or guilty and how much 
you had to, to punt, to pay, whether that was eventually by hanging or, or death or was it a monetary fine early on. The Shire Reeve also had the ability to hire, not even hire, he would impress people to be his posse. It's called posse comatose, what we would take vigilantes. And they were called vigilantes, and that was not a bad term then. The Shire Reeve also had the uh, authority of the crown to go between shires. There was a reeve who was under him who could only stay within the shire, but the Shire Reeve could go outside of the shires to, to, to gather up these criminals, these criminals, these trespassers, these cattle rustlers mostly, and bring them back. We still see the shire, or the, the sheriff, all the way through the 18th, 19th, 20th century. We still see him today. And by and large, he is the, uh, well, he's the head law enforcement officer of the, of the whole county, of Shire County. Um, the constable, it's another term that we're going to see. He's an undersheriff. He he's, um, would have been equivalent to a reeve. Uh, the constable's job was a bit different, though. The constable had the responsibility of taking the, the people that the sheriff would pick up to court. And oftentimes, the constable would have to house these people in his own house before he got them uh, in to see uh, the, the magistrate for punishment or to crime or to be thrown uh, or even taken to the Old Bailey or wherever they were going. So the constable, uh, his, his job wasn't a lot of fun because, you know, I've got a wife, I've got three or four kids, and now I've got to house this convict overnight. But it's what it was. Early on, the constables um, had different jobs. I'm looking at the 18th century now. Um, uh, the beadle. The beadle's going to be the same as a constable, but primarily in the 18th century, he's a church person. He's de- he's um, within the church. The The church's influence on law will change in the latter part of the, eight, uh, the 17th century, but the beadle still exists. He still works with the sheriff. He's essentially a constable. Again, his big thing was, though, he oversaw the church's workhouses and their orphanages and and the charity. So if if there was charity needed, it was the beadle who would, who would dole out and decide if he needed charity. He was also the one who organized... Um, uh, the the people who needed to go in the workhouses, the orphanages, this again will change. I, I'll let Maggie talk about that a bit more later. Um, but he was also responsible for calling people to council, church council, um, because even though the church's influence is waning within the law, the church could call a council and uh, let their opinions and thoughts be known to the crown, to the law, and they would take them. And it was the Beatles' responsibility to go around and call the council itself. The Night Watch. Uh, The Night Watch is one of the earliest after the sheriff. Um, The purpose of the Night Watch was just for surveillance for petty crimes. That and the fact that, oh, look, there's somebody watching me. I don't want to go do that. They were responsible for setting up a hue and cry. Uh, They didn't stop a crime from happening. They would set up a hue and cry. And by law, anybody over the age of 12 who saw a crime had had to set up a hue and cry. That alerted the other people so that we can get together and stop the crime before it happening. Because remember, I want to stop this crime that my friend is doing because I'm the one who's going to be monetarily punished for this early on. So that was the purpose of a night watchman. Eventually, the night watchman will be the person who you see him in an old movies going around, oh, you know, six o'clock is all's well, whatever. He's also the one that's going to be lighting the lamps and things like that. But by and large, his responsibility is to look out for fires and to be on the lookout for petty crime. Again, to set up a hue and cry. He has no powers of, of arrest or anything like that. Uh, the bailiff is just another term for an undersheriff. Uh, if you see the term bailiff, it doesn't mean he's the guy working at the prison. Uh, he oftentimes was working at a prison because he was an undersheriff or, or just a reeve. Uh, by the 18th century, we see him primarily in, in, the, in the prisons themselves. And now, a bum bailiff. Um, that was a person who dealt specifically with debtors. Now, yes, we're having a big change in, in debt relief and the laws against debt relief. I think I mentioned this in the last video that I did by myself. The bum bailiff is responsible for paying up the debtors and uh, putting them into to debtor's prison. Of course, uh, early on in the 18th century, we do away with debtor's prisons. But uh, he's still responsible for the ones gathering up debtors, making sure that you're paying your debts. Uh, we will use the term bum bailiff in the cant language to kind of refer to anybody who's not the high sheriff or the sheriff or the shire reeve. Uh, now the Harmonbeck, I find the Harmonbeck fascinating because the Harmonbeck is in our language, it's the cant language. Uh, hopefully I'll discuss some more of this uh, with you when um, Christopher and the schoolmaster talk about um, the cant language in a, in a few episodes coming up. But I wonder if, oh, Harmon Beckett was just a reference to any, any uh, of the 
law enforcement officers in the Cant language. If you, here comes the Harmon back, or the bum bailiff for the two phrases we're going to use most. I wonder, though, because Thomas Harmon was a 17th century playwright. He was also a writer of a, a great book on canting, on the canting language. Again, I'm going to bring that up a little bit later. He's one of the first people to really delve into the social aspects of it, and modern historians today consider him uh, a very good resource for, for social uh, ethnicity of what was going on within the criminal mind. He was, a, like I said, he was a thief taker. I think he was a constable, or not a thief taker. He was a, um, a night watchman. I think he was a constable. I think that, that times that he didn't have to put them up. Um, so that brings us up to what uh, I think probably the one person that, Paul, you're most interested in would be the thief taker. Now, I don't want to delve into thief taking a lot um, because it, it's a whole different, it's, uh, it's, it's just so much. There's just so much to talk about the thief taker. Very quickly, though, what uh, Queen Mary will do <clears throat> of William and Mary fame in 1692, she will work with the Society for the Reformation of Manners, and she's going to put an edict on the books that any person, any person who um, apprehends or tracks down, apprehends, um, prosecutes, and commit con uh, and convicts a, a person for breaking a crime is entitled to 40 pounds, paid for by the crown. They were called thief takers, the idea there's so much thief go theft going on that we've got to have somebody gather these up. Uh, remember Henry Feeling's um, argument that we've got too many um, people being led to slaughter was because for 40 pounds you yourself can go out and, uh, and rat out somebody and get them. And even what we would consider a petty crime today, a stealing a handkerchief, was, it was a death sentence in this time period. It was pretty bad. But anyway, that's something else that we can discuss. There's so, as I said earlier, there's so much more we can discuss in this. But the thief taker, probably the most famous, was Jonathan Wild, uh, thief taker general. Now, I'm not going to go a lot into detail on, on Jonathan Wild. Uh, I'm going to refer you to uh, a magazine article that's coming out in Reliving History magazine in just a couple of weeks, the fall issue. Um, it's entitled uh, Opera for a Beggar. That's where I've talked about the Beggar's Opera, but I was talking specifically about uh, Jonathan Wilde, Jack Shepard, and um, Jenny Diver and their roles uh, that influenced um, Gay when he was writing the opera. But I, I delve a bit into their background, what a thief taker was, why he did it. So I encourage you to get a hold of Samson, um, histori uh, I'm sorry, Samson Historical. We'll drop a link in the, in the, in the comments below, so that you, or in the description below, so that you can um, hook up with them, get the article, a good article. Um, You'll find a bit more about the thief takers there. But that was unique to, to England. And the thief takers were also going to establish something that's going to come up and, and bring us into our next section uh, of what's going on in the colonies. So um, to end on the thief taker, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, these are a couple of quotes. This is from B.E. Gant. I've mentioned him a lot in other, uh, other uh, um, videos that we've made. Uh, he was the one who wrote uh, the Canting Dictionary. Uh, his definition of a thief taker, who make a trade of helping people for a gratuity to their lost goods, and sometimes for interest or envy, snapping up the rogues themselves, being usually in, fee, in sea with them and acquainted with their haunts. Okay, so we see this a lot in Jack and uh, Jonathan Wilde as well. The thief taker would often be the one who is in cahoots with the person doing the crime, the stealing. Oftentimes, in the case of, of Wild, uh, he ran a lost property office where you would come and say, oh, I've lost this. And he would say, oh, is this what you've lost for a fee? Uh, I'll return your property and I'll go prosecute the guy who, who did it. Well, because he knew who did it. Um, that got him in trouble, too. Again, check out the magazine article that will talk about. Gross said about 100 years later, in the turn of the uh, 19th century, uh, in his dictionary, uh, slang dictionary, he's going to write uh, of the thief taker, the definition, fellows who associate with all kinds of villains in order to betray them when they have committed a crime which entitles a person taking them to a handsome reward called blood money. Now, this is the first time we see the reference blood money. That's gross. I've never found it anywhere else except gross, early, earlier than gross, where he's referring it to as blood money. Uh, I do know that Jonathan Wilde will term, will, he will be responsible for terming the phrase uh, double cross because when you did something that Jonathan Wilde didn't like he would put in uh, a cross by your name he had a list of people that he worked with or worked for him 
If you did it a second time, he would put a second cross by your name. That indicated to him that uh, you were no longer any use to him. And when he decided he needed an extra 40 pounds, he'd go pick you up and, ch- and have you charged and, and punished like that. So what's going to happen also with the thief takers is we begin to see a lot of transportation. And transportation will lead us into what's going on in the colonies. So let's talk about the colonies. All right, the colonies. What's going on in the colonies? For one thing, we've got a lot of criminal element in the colonies. Why? Because of transportation. The Transportation Act of of 1718. That's going to basically say instead of executing you, we're going to send you for a seven-year forced indentureship to the colonies. Uh, I discussed this in length, again, in Reliving History Magazine in the summer issue that just came out a couple of months back in Reliving History Magazine uh, called Colonial Dumping Ground. Again, uh, pick it up. I think it's a great article. It gives a good oversight in transportation and what happened, why we get so many criminals here in the colonies. <clears throat> Again, drop a uh, we'll drop a note down below. We don't see as many hangings in the colonies. Uh, we still see hangings, they were, but we see a lot more of the other things, cutting off of the ears, uh, the boring of the, the tongue. Uh, we see a lot of uh, the running the gauntlet. Uh, burning, branding of the cheek, things like that, caning, stocks, pillars. Uh, the stocks weren't as pleasant as you think they were. A lot of people died in the stocks, even though uh, traditionally, if you're put in the stocks, you're only there for two or three hours at a time. Even, and a lot of times it was broken up. Uh, Elizabeth Needham was put in the stocks for two hours, one, uh, one hour on Friday, one hour on Saturday. Unfortunately, uh, she didn't make it to Saturday. Uh, she was so severely beaten uh, because that's what pummeling was all about. People were allowed to throw things at you, hit you, spit on you, whatever they wanted. And it it was not encouraged, but it wasn't frowned on. Well, it was frowned on, but not encouraged. But they did it anyway. She died uh, because of that. And we'll talk about that again when we talk about punishments. But in the colonies, um, we don't have a a problem with cattle rustling. We've got a problem with hog stealing. I don't know what it is about you people. You want my hogs. Every time we turn around, somebody's stealing hogs. I don't don't know, but but hog stealing. Uh, Three strikes of hog stealing, and and you're executed. You don't have a choice. Now, the colonies, again, we're using English law because we're English. The thing of it is, uh, the interesting thing about the oldest listing for a sheriff is actually in 1634, Captain William Stone. Now, he's appointed sheriff. He's in the Shire of Nottingham. uh, I'm sorry, he's in the Shire of Northampton in Virginia. He's appointed by the crown. What's going to change, though, And just a few years later, in 1652, they elect the sheriff. And that's the first time I can find that a sheriff himself is being elected. Up until now, he's appointed. It might have been different. Again, there's a lot out there. But what I found so far in just my looking, um, William Waters, same place, Northampton, Virginia, he's elected sheriff. Now, the population is much different. We have, and I think I discussed this in my last video, London in 1800 is population 1.2 million here in the colonies or the states by now, the United States in 1800. We have a population of 5.2 million. So vast amounts of space, not nearly as many people. Little tiny space, huge amount of people. So that's probably why we don't see as much of the real criminal element going on. For one thing, you can't do as much. I mean, it really limits uh, Penelope to what she can do because nobody has enough to steal and everybody knows who you are. And Maggie can't do enough begging because, well, there's, nobody has anything to give. So uh, we don't see as much begging uh, in, in, the, in the mass amounts that we see overseas here in the colonies. Um, America is very, um, uh, it's a parochialistic society. It's uh, very insular. They estimate that in the 18th century, the average person won't go more than 30 miles. He'll spend the bulk of his life within five miles of where he was born. He won't travel more than 30 miles. Very rare. There were some, yes, I know, but very, very rare. By and large, uh, in the 18th century, you will interact with between one and 3,000 people. That's it. You're going to know the people in your county and the surrounding counties. So you know people, and you know when strangers come into town. You might not know everybody by name, these 3,000 people, but you would know them by sight. Um, I, I, I love this guy, Joshua Hampstead, uh, 1678 to 1758. He was a good example of what's going on. He kept a da- uh, He's from New London. He keeps a daily diary. Now, he does this for a number of reasons. One thing, a lot of people kept diaries. That's why we know so much about these. But he was a stonecutter. Uh, a grave cutter. He was also a constable and a justice of the peace, and what he would have been called a justice of the peace here. And he was a surveyor, so he had a lot of interaction and traveled extensively around his his uh, three or four county area. He 
logged over 6,000 different people, most of them by name that he knew, because he knew a lot more than most people would. But the ones that he didn't know, he specifically commented on, this is a new person, and he described them. But he would describe them, they were coming from this direction, or they said they were coming from here, they said they were going there. Uh, he would describe their dress, he would describe any physical uh, differentiations about them. He would describe their, their dialect, uh, so that he was... Uh, look, this is the person. So you know who this person was. So if uh, somebody steals something down the road and all I have is a description and uh, Joshua says, oh, wait a minute, I remember seeing him. Let me go back to my, oh, yes, did he look like this? He will blah, 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 because here's how we describe him because we don't know his name. Then we know where he came from. We have a pretty good idea of where he's going. They can track him down that way. Um, Americans are very untrusting. They're always, a, they're just not a trusting people. That's a, uh, not really uh, a good thing to happen, but what the heck. Um, and because they're not trusting, that forces people like Penelope uh, to really have to go underground. It forces people like Maggie to work even harder and depend more upon uh, what's going on in the workhouses and things like that. But it makes it easier for me because nobody trusts anybody else that they don't know. But if I come in as a sharper, looking nice, being friendly, having flashing money around, being very friendly, um, even when you lose at my games, oh, I'm, oh, that's, that's too bad. Uh, look, I will try it again. Maybe you can, you know, here, we'll try it again. Um, I'm going to come very outgoing and very frustrated. And I'm also going to play on one other thing. Americans love to gamble. They always have and they always will. Because of that, when to the 19th century, as we see everybody else fall off, I'm going to take over and I'm going to become such a fantastic character all through the Old West, even into modern times today. Uh, the gamblers that um, this is romanticized. Oh, the gambler's coming to town. We don't like him. We don't trust him. Oh, let's go watch it. Okay, why are you going to watch me? Because you think you're going to get something because of avarice and greed. Somebody earlier on asked me, we're going to see Christopher's games. If you want to play a real 18th century game, you still can today. It's called the lottery, and it sucks. The lottery's been played, and it's been a scam for about 600 years. So if you want to play a, a game in the 18th century and find out what it's like to have your hopes really brought up there and basically to get suckered, go buy a lottery ticket. Yeah, just send me the money. What the heck? Uh, so um, we we have a lot more cr criminals coming over here because of the Transportation Act. Again, uh, check out the article. Now, when they finish their seven-year transportation, quite a few of them stay here because they don't have any money to get back to England, so a number of them do stay here. But they take on the most menial of jobs, the lowest of jobs, because they're not trusted, they're not liked, they're not welcome. Um, it's just not a, not a good point. Uh, I, I, I do want to touch very quickly because gamblers walk the line between gambling and entertainment as well. Uh, Peter Bean, in his book, uh, For a Short Time Only, estimates that between 1686 and 1825, only 25% of itinerant entertainers in America were born in America. So that 75% of all the entertainment that you see coming over here is going to come from England. And again, we're not trusted, we're not liked, and that's why you see a lot of entertainers having such a bad reputation, because we're not known, we're not liked. I don't see a lot of entertainers being punished, um, or thrown in jail. Uh, I see a lot of them chased out of town, uh, not trusted. Oddly enough, they're always chased out of town after they've given their show and their production. We do see that a lot more than anything. So it was easier here in the colonies if we see something we don't like, unless it was such a heinous crime that we're going to hang you, we're going to punish you and then kick you out of the area, just get you out completely. That's something we cannot do in London because there's so many people in London, there's no place to go. But here in the American colonies, We've got this vast place that we can go, many, many places we can go. Unfortunately, nobody likes us there either, so we're kind of stuck. We're always going to be stuck, downtrodden. So uh, hopefully, Paul, that uh, does answer your questions. Um, probably gave you a lot more questions uh, than answered. Uh, but again, if you do if you do have questions and if you something in this in the video you want me to discuss a little bit more, go into more detail, uh, let me know. Um, other than that, well... The holidays are coming around the corner, so special for you coming up here at Scoundrels Alley. Uh, Badger is going to be talking about digging up decorations for Halloween. Maggie's going to come up talking about her special recipes for porch pumpkins. Where to find them, how to get them, and how not to get caught taking them. Uh, Penelope, of course, is going to continue her dissertation on how to raise up a child. 
Okay. And, of course, Christopher is going to be coming in, uh, especially because of Thanksgiving dinner with a lot of your friends and family and politics going on. He'll be discussing the shiv in polite company. Well, that's all the time I have, and I do have to run. I've got a lot of work to do myself. Now, again, like, share, and subscribe. And, uh, well, we'll see you in a little while. In fact, I'll see you tomorrow night at the tavern. Well, with a little bit of luck. Now, d don't worry. If you don't see me at the tavern, um, that's okay. Because if this doesn't work out, well, you know what? Um, oh, what the heck. I'll see you in 6 to 10. Uh, 4 with good behavior. Uh, I hope, I hope, it's off to work we go. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, it's off to work we go.